Alejandra, if you want, you can change it because it has my name on your image. Oh, it does. You can change that. Oh. <laughs> I'll do that. Hello, everybody. Buenas noches. Buenas tardes. Welcome to En Casa con la Plaza. I'm Abelardo de la Peña Jr., Director of Marketing and Communications with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes. La Plaza de Cultura y Artes brings you these conversations, presentations, demonstrations, performances, and more from our home to yours. Three times a week, sometimes more, it's our way of fulfilling our mission to tell the little known stories of Mexicans, Mexican Americans, and now Latinos and Latinx in the founding growth and evolution of the LA region and beyond. If you're on Zoom, you see that we have a little chat feature there. Let us know where you're viewing from. We have a Q&A. If you have any questions, please use it. We may answer it during or after the programming is over. If you're on Facebook, all of you on Facebook Live, same thing. You have the comments section. Let us know where you're viewing from. Ask questions, make comments, shout out to our present to our presenters. Uh, and today, a real special program. This is the tail end of Latino Heritage Month, and we have with us Pop Up Magazine, Tales of Fearless Creativity with Jose Badi and Alejandra Vasquez. Pop Up Magazine brings storytelling to life on stages throughout the US pre pandemic. But in light of the pandemic, they're bringing these stories to audiences online. And in honor of Latinx Heritage Month, they've compiled stories that are unique representations of Latinx experience in the US, Latin America, and here in LA. This new collection of stories celebrates Latinx voices, their tales of fearless creativity, songs of love and longing, inspired advice for public speaking, and more. So I'd like to, first of all, introduce who, or let you know who's gonna be here with us. We have Jose Vadi. He specializes in identifying complex human-centered stories and telling them in ways that keep readers engaged and viewers watching. I checked out his LinkedIn. I checked out a lot of the websites that he's been uh, contributing to. And this guy, man, he's a multi-hyphenate poet, <laughs> playwright, SAS, living in Oakland, California. And his writing has most recently appeared in the LA Review of Books, Hold the Journal, McSweeney's and Catapult. We also have with us Alejandra Vasquez, a Mexican-American filmmaker and producer from rural West Texas. She studied film at UC Berkeley, produced radio at NPR and read, and ran Ted's nonfiction imprint before pivoting to video. Now she's at work on a film about her hometown with support from the International Women's Media Foundation. And she's developed a series about US-Mexico border for ITVS. And I also checked out uh, uh, a series about eating as she had, I think it was on topic uh, website, S uh, subscription uh, uh, model where incredible short videos. So that's what we'll be doing. We'll be introducing these filmmakers and then showing you these short but sweet documentaries. So let's start with Alejandra who will be presenting to us a short documentary called Varsity Oro. Alejandra, please join us. Hi everyone, thanks for being here um, and thanks for having us La Plaza. We're so excited to be here. Um, my name is Alejandra Vasquez. I am based in Boulder, Colorado and yeah, I'm from a really small town in Texas. Um, and this, this story takes place in a really small town in Texas, but in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, it's a story about high schoolers embracing their heritage um, and I can't wait for you to watch it. All right, well here we go. This is called Going Varsity. And I'm going to share the screen and we're going to start the show. Please enjoy. Oh, I stand at your. Sorry. <laughs> this is live, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the share and go to the correct one this time. Going varsity. All right. The Friday night lights typically shine on high school football players in Texas. 
But if you head south on Highway 281 to Edinburgh North High School, you'll find a different kind of team. Varsity Mariachi. Mariachi Oro is just three days away from their biggest competition of the year. As one of the top ranked teams in Texas, their coach is expecting perfection. Mariachi Oro, you can start your performance for the 2020 UIL State Mariachi Festival. That's not together. That's not together. You need to watch. That's not together. Violins and trumpets are not together at all. I'm the mariachi director here at Edinburgh North High School, uh, my 10th year teaching, and um, I love mariachi. Yes, I was born and raised here in Edinburgh, so mariachi did not become a class, an actual full class in, at, here at Edinburgh North High School until about 14 years after I graduated high school. Even before I, I, was, I was a director here, the students have placed towards the top at state competition. I've been very, very fortunate that we do have two state championships. I love mariachi. Yes, I was born and raised here in Edinburgh. What the heck was that? Does anybody know what that was? Nobody knows? The trumpets, the trumpet section was, was late. Oh, yeah. Focus guys, focus please, count, focus. Edinburgh sits just 20 miles north of the Mexican border, in the middle of the Rio Grande Valley. People call this area El Valle. It's the heart of mariachi in Texas. Mariachi's popularity in Texas high schools has exploded in the past decade, but this is only the second year it's been sanctioned for state competition. Today, over half the students enrolled in Texas public schools are Hispanic. It's a big deal for an activity rooted in Mexican culture to get the same recognition as football, cheer, or marching band. Mariachi Oro has 11 seniors. There's Marifer, the group leader, Denise, an aspiring neuroscientist with a big voice, and Nathan, a second generation mariachi who's been playing violin for nearly his entire life. How many years you Kima? I was about to be two years old in that picture. I actually still had that suit up to like three years ago and my dad decided to sell it to someone else. It actually still fits. I started standing there when I was four with the violin. And I wouldn't play, I would just stand there and you know, you know just fake it. Nathan grew up watching his dad play in Mariachi Manantiel de Salvación de Fernando Fernandez, a well-known group in Edinburgh his dad founded 34 years ago. And he was always my inspiration, you know, my, you know, the person to follow. He got a heart attack the August 8th, and that was on a Thursday night. And that night, I told him, Dad, I am never going to fill up your shoes, you know. And he told me, well, you don't have to right now, you know, it's a, it's a process and everything, so. Nathan's dad just passed away uh, about a month ago. You know, when that happened, you know, Nathan, he had to be the one that's earning the money and taking care of his dad's group. My whole life has revolved around mariachi, and my whole life is going to revolve around mariachi. <laughs> mariachi has been around since at least the mid-19th century. It's usually played on special occasions, from baptisms to quinceañeras to weddings and funerals. But most Americans associate it with Mexican restaurants. You know, those guys who wear the full charro outfits going from table to table playing songs? Mariachis call that working al talón, which literally means on your heels. I do it with my friends, we go and hang out. We get the money and we have a nice dinner after. We 
we use it as a learning experience, as a hangout, as a guys' night out, you know, and stuff. So that's basically what it is, looking for work. And that's what we learned. What were you doing when I called you? I was doing homework. I still got to do homework when I get back. Okay. How much do you have? 60. I figured it's I'm going to take this because you didn't know half of the songs that we were playing. Historically, mariachi has been dominated by men, but that's changing. Women make up about half of mariachi oro. Denise and Marifer both started playing violin in middle school and joined the varsity team as freshmen. Now as they plan for life after high school, they're hoping to pursue a career that involves music. I really want to either get into UC Berkeley or Baylor because of their research facilities. Um, my major would be neuroscience on how music influences the brain, but the problem is that their tuition is about 55000 On top of bills and that stuff, I don't want to put that burden on my parents. So I'm trying to get scholarships. Right now I'm working on, it's called uh, Nuestra Cultura Scholarship. It's a mariachi scholarship, and I'm halfway done. I just need two letters of recommendation, and I'm just getting those. Hey Hector, I'm outside. In February, the moment Mariachi Oro had spent all year preparing for finally arrived. Over 80 teams descended on Edinburgh to compete in the State Mariachi Festival. Each team wears a traditional uniform called a traje de charro. Fitted pants, a short jacket, and a wide brim sombrero. But the girls put their own spin on it. Since it's very male dominated, we have to show men that girls can do it as well. We have to sing like we're men. <laughs> we have to uh, put our hair in a ponytail to like mimic that male hairdo. To make it more female, we put a hair bow. We have to get out of that a thing of it's just for males. Alright guys, so don't forget, what are the three words that define Edinburgh North Mariachi? Pride, pride. honor, legacy. 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 Play with pride to honor the members before you and leave a legacy for the members after you. Always go over there and kick some butt. The next mariachi in conference 6A is the Edinburgh North High School Mariachi Oro de ENHS.
moviendo la cabecita, moviendo la cabecita, este gusto es el demonio. Oh my gosh, that was that was very moving, very emotional. I wanted to shout a grito out. So how did uh, we stop this here? How did what what compelled you to make this documentary? Do you love mariachi? I love mariachi. <laughs> I I didn't know that these that there were programs at schools like this, and so when I found out, I was like. I just wanted to go there, you know, I wanted to see the schools, meet the kids that were like in these mariachi programs. And, and what, how did you make that connection? Just reached out. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I found out that there was a competition and it was happening like within a month. And so me and my filmmaking partner, we just like reached out to a bunch of different schools around the area, the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and we landed on Edinburgh because of, mostly because of Abel, honestly, the, the instructor, he's amazing. He was so open and he just like made it super easy for us in terms of he was just like, he was just with us the whole time and let us spend a lot of time with the kids and, you know, spend time with him after school. And, and it was just, everything started to click. We found out that their team had been going through a lot that year, as you see in the film, you know, with Nathan's dad. And, with, you know, a lot of the seniors were leaving. And so there was just a lot going on and it just felt like the right place to be. And I, I, as I recall, early in the pandemic, there was a viral video that, that went out. And I'm pretty sure it was this mariachi that, uh, that really just blew up. I don't, I don't know if it was this mariachi. It might have been. Um, they have been doing, so they were, you know, the end, um, at the end, there was like the whole, through the video, their performances through video. So they had been doing that um, before we reached out and asked if we could do that for this. Um, but yeah, so they've been, even like last week, they released a video. So they're just like, yeah, they're still playing together over Zoom. They're still not in class. Wow, well, well from Judy Cervantes, she says this, that was amazing. My father has been a mariachi his entire life. He played with Los Camperos de Naticano from the onset, I'm watching this now with my eight-year-old daughter and niece. So what would you recommend to, to young people who want to get into mariachi, from your experience? Well, from, from my, I'm not in mariachi, but what I heard from Abel, who I like talk to a lot and how he's a good friend, play violin. <laughs> it's like, you know, if, if you're really interested in mariachi, like he said, pick up the violin. It's like the way to get into it. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh, please hang around. We're gonna uh, get back to you. We have, uh, just to let you know, we have uh, Maria Barragan watching from West Valley City in Utah. Uh, Maria Elena Gomez watching from Aguacatelandia. Aguacatelandia, I don't know where that is. Well, welcome. And Omar Medrano uh, here from Lancaster, California. So we have a, a wide ranging audience who's really enjoying this. I know I'm enjoying it. I, I caught a little bit of each video before, but I wanted to be surprised as well and enjoy it live just like everybody else out there is. Okay, next up we have Jose, Jose Vadi. Uh, as I said, he specializes in identifying conflicts. Uh, he's just an all around guy who's very creative, who's doing a lot of things. And if you could just tell us a little bit about the upcoming video called Call and Response. Jose. 
Yeah, thank you so much. Um, you know, this is a story about um, two individuals, Rachel Smith and Alex. Um, I met Rachel earlier this summer and she created this amazing grassroots organization that led to volunteers like Alex making PPE, um, uh, personal protective equipment, which is still very much in demand and need amidst this pandemic um, for frontline workers, for medical, um, for all types of folks. So this is just a small example of a young woman from Whittier, if anyone's from Whittier, anyone near the 605 tuning in today, um, you know, shout out and welcome. But uh, that's where Rachel's from and that's kind of where the story begins. So uh, hope you enjoy it. All right, well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure we got the right one here. So, so here we go. Thank you so much. Imagine a warm Friday night in Southern California. Maybe you're playing soccer outside under the streetlights or watching movies inside when suddenly everything goes dark. So if the power goes out for everyone around me still to this day, the city will go out and help everyone except our neighborhood last. That's Rachel Smith. And these blackouts were a part of her childhood in the unincorporated part of Whittier a sleepy town southeast of downtown Los Angeles. Where I'm from is predominantly a Hispanic working class neighborhood. So I'm Mexican American. Um, everyone I know in my neighborhood is Latinx. The blackouts were an early lesson in the way things work and don't work. But there were other lessons too. Rachel's mom is a painter. She's still down to make art with Rachel and her friends anytime. Her dad was a machinist who could build just about anything. So I always kind of had technology and art growing up. I was involved in various art communities, so I helped in creating flyers for shows or helped with art projects. I basically have been a creative pretty much my whole entire life. Rachel was winding down her weekend when her job emailed everyone to stay home. The virus had arrived. I specifically remember the date, it was March 15th. I honestly, I felt really overwhelmed. I felt isolated. Rachel is a UX designer for Nordstrom. UX design stands for user experience design. A lot of people think that it applies solely to website designing, but actually it's just designing for human behavior. She wondered if there were other designers out there who wanted to do something to fight coronavirus. So she bought the URL designed to combat COVID-19.com and created her first Slack community. She invited friends on Twitter. Overnight, 100 people joined. Designers could propose a new project, create a new Slack channel, and then go. Some people designed posters with health and safety info for Canadian hospitals. Others went hunting for translators or mask sewing guides. It was a start but a little scattered. I think a tendency in humans is to always want to create solutions right away. Like, let's fix this problem. But as a user experience person, you really have to take a step back and think about, okay, am I solving for the right problem? Pretty soon, the group noticed something. A lot of their projects were trying to get masks and face shields into the hands of doctors and nurses. So a new community emerged, Masks for Docs, co-founded with another volunteer, Chad Loader. They built a website with 3D printing templates, mask making guides, and resources in multiple languages. They grew to 5,000 volunteers across six continents. One chapter sent 500 face shields to food delivery volunteers in Seattle. In New York, dozens of bikers formed a moto squad to ship supplies to local hospitals. In San Francisco, Jeannie Lindquist and her Star Wars Cosplay Club used to get together to sew costumes. She organized costume clubs across the city to sew more than 1,000 masks. Alex Torres is 18 years old and the co-chair of the Mask for Docs chapter in Santa Clara, California. He just graduated. He delivered his salutatorian speech into a webcam. Alex played marimba in his high school's marching band and ran a Dungeons and Dragons club. He got into 3D printers and engineering class, and his parents surprised him and bought him one, but he didn't know what to do with it until March. It was on March 13th, ironically enough, Friday the 13th, when, to me, the world seemed to stop spinning. School went remote. Everything went remote. Alex felt lost. 
Then his mom saw someone making 3D printed face shields on a YouTube video. Alex dug out his printer and found Mass for Docs templates online. The school has what defined my existence before March 13th. Afterwards, I wasn't really sure until Mass for Docs came around. Then my purpose became helping out those in need and those who needed the PPE the most. Alex started calling around to tech companies looking for 3D printers he could borrow. One printer became two printers and then four. The family living room turned into a maker space. He ran the printers 24 hours a day. They have a really sweet sure hum to them. Like it'll go like, and it's a noise that we actually got very used to after a while. Add it up, Masks for Docs has delivered more than 100,000 masks and face shields around the world. It hasn't been easy. We had folks we knew personally who were contracting COVID, who were getting sick. It just felt like the circle around us was getting smaller and smaller. Our volunteers were just dropping left and right. There's a term I learned from some mutual aid folks. It's called empathy exhaustion. You feel like you want to help constantly, but it ends up taking a toll on you mentally. And I have volunteers who are coming to me literally crying, saying, I don't know if I could handle this pressure anymore. I would say that when we had these moments of seeing pictures of doctors and nurses holding the personal protective equipment that we were providing, that those were the moments where I was like, okay, this is real. We aren't just sweating and crying and doing all this hard work for nothing. This fall, Rachel and her network are looking for new ways to contribute, like getting masks to teachers who have to return to the classroom. Alex is sending most of his face shields to farm workers. We moved on to helping out farm workers, because even though they're not what people think of when they think frontline responders, they're still the ones who are looking to get food on our plates. And they're one of the highest risk groups, like disproportionately when compared to the others. So if there's ever a moment where folks think they can't make a difference, you absolutely can. People are listening, people want to help, and people definitely want to step up especially during this time. Wow, pretty incredible. That's quite a story, Jose. Uh, I think you told us in the beginning how you first got in contact with, with Alex. Could you explain how you, you first learned about this story? Yeah, of course. Um, so I met, um, you know, Alex is basically over here in uh, Gilroy, kind of in the, uh, the kind of south of San Jose area, um, here kind of towards the Bay Area. Um, and he, you know, volunteered as a high school senior after seeing des um, this Design to Combat COVID-19 website and this Mass for Docs community. And, you know, Rachel started that in, in March on her own with some other design friends. And uh, I believe in around June, um, I met Rachel because I used to work for like a kind of software tutorial, like YouTube show. And we had Rachel on as a guest presenting on um, this project and the different resources that she helped um, create, you know, open source download files um, for UI UX designers and um, just kind of the intersection of tech and kind of mutual aid and activism um, amidst this, you know, crazy pandemic. So just hearing Rachel's story and keeping in touch with her over the summer allowed me to meet Alex, who, you know, um, as you can tell by the video, is a really exceptional young person who's super driven. Um, and as you can see, I mean, those 3D printers are no joke. Um, they're still, they take a lot, they, they break very frequently. Um, and Alex was repairing those while keeping one always on, always printing 24 hours a day. So um, that's the, over the course of the summer, um, that's, that's how the story kind of came about. And what I, very striking about the, your story is the use of animation, still photography, the recordings, you know, you are in front of your camera, all done in a very socially distant way, which is of course what is, what is needed nowadays. And how did that come together? 
it was a it was a massive effort and it, you know it's a um on a, on a pretty short timeline and, and like a lot of the other pieces from this episode you know many of them were, were produced remotely so you know we're coordinating me picking up lighting and audio gear from you know someone in baltimore communicating with someone in san francisco so every, our whole team was spread out all over the place um you know and in terms of like directing there was like a lot of pre-production so you know doing a tech rehearsal and basically being directed through zoom you know kind of different you know angles for lighting and different you know um just the qualities of filming and stuff like that so between a camera that i've had for a little while and some gear from pop-up we were able to lock down the script and once the script is locked down we were able to pass it out to the art department and different members of our team to start the illustration and photography process. So um, we'll we'll add we'll add a link to the uh, in the chat with the with to the show so people can check out the different illustrators involved and the photographers involved. Um, and we also had you know music supervision, you know original score for this piece as well. So um, which was supervised by Cheche Al Alara. So um, you know who I, I believe is based in Los Angeles. So we really just kind of utilized once we had the script locked passing that off to other departments to do their thing was was a, a beautiful gift to have as a writer for this piece. Sure, and one last question or, or comment is really that the youth uh, uh, the, the, of, of, the, of the participants in this project uh, and how they really came together utilizing their skills, their talents, and their passion to, uh, to really make a difference. Do you find that the that the young people are taking this more seriously than, than older generations? I think it's kind of, um, I think they're definitely taking it seriously. And I think that they, what they've learned from previous generations, they're applying with the tools that they have today, whether it's social media or 3D printing or things that, you know, um, they're really kind of taking the baton and running with it in their own way, in their own language and allowing all generations to kind of see once again you know the youth united will never be defeated and um you know they're doing it in their way and their style the reason we're saying black lives matter um is a product of young people's efforts you know so um it's 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 amazing to see um this year how the different whether it's terminology or different direct actions or different forms of mutual aid that we're seeing a lot of it is being driven by young people who know that they're gonna be the solutions to many of the problems that we see today. So it's a great intergenerational effort. And as we saw in Varsity Oro as well, a lot of young people doing a lot of positive things out there. All right, well, thank you. Uh, well, the, the next documentary and the last one of, of today's session is called The Serenade, uh, narrated by La Marisol, a, a very great friend of La Plaza de Cultura y Artes and written by Josh Kuhn. Uh, who, who produced and directed this one? Oh, this was this was a big uh, team effort. Um, uh, I believe, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to identify the lead the lead di director of, of the whole thing for this show. I had the privilege of interviewing Omar Leon, um, who's a member of Los Paraneros of Norte, um, one of the, the band featured in this program. Um, but this is a real, you know, uh, team effort from the pop up studio. All right, great. Well, here we go with the next one called the Serenade. Uh, and so I'll share the screen here. Click on that, click on that, and enjoy, please. I stand at your gate, and the song that I sing is of moonlight. I stand, and I wait for the touch of your hand in the June night. The roses are sighing a moonlight serenade. The stars are aglow, and tonight, how their light sets me dreaming. My love, do you know that your eyes are like stars brightly beaming? I bring you, and I sing you, a moonlight serenade. Since the late Middle Ages, a serenade has required a few key ingredients. You need someone in love and you need a beloved. You need that love to be unrequited, a love that is in route, in the air. 
You need a voice to sing a song, and if it was still the Middle Ages, you'd need a lute. But now, an acoustic guitar will do just fine. In Mexico, where the serenades continue to live its most vibrant contemporary life, it's usually delivered by a squad of moral support, a mariachi of plucked strings, caressed violins, and chirping trumpets. A serenade also requires physical distance. The lover who is separated from the beloved, divided by position, by place. The lover is down on the street. The beloved is up on the balcony. The serenade has always needed a wall. The Metropolitan Detention Center in downtown Los Angeles is a towering nine-story slab of imposing concrete and razor wire. Its facade is packed with small slivers of windows. Behind them, men and women are locked in cells, many of them from Central America and Mexico, picked up for having the wrong papers, for overstaying visas, for driving without licenses, for missing deportation deadlines. Some will stay here for weeks and months awaiting trial. Others are about to be deported, dumped back somewhere south of the borderline. This detention center, like the over 200 others scattered across the United States, is a factory of limbo and removal, separation and loss. One evening, on the sidewalk below the detention center's northern wall, a group of musicians had just finished playing a set. The band, Los Jornaleros del Norte, the day laborers of the north, is made up of former and working day laborers. When they're not playing immigration marches or protesting in front of City Hall or leading songwriting workshops for other laborers, they perform at the foot of the detention center, sending their songs up to jump the gate, to scale the wall, to bend the bars. As the band was packing up their instruments, their singer Omar Leon noticed a woman standing nearby with two young kids holding balloons and a poster board that read, Te queremos mucho, te extrañamos, we love you so much, we miss you. Omar introduced himself. She told me, well, there's a time during the day, more, mainly after dinner, when the prisoners walk from the lunch area towards their cells and they are able to see. Some of them, they can look for like seconds and they can see their families waving up at them and they can see like the signs. That's why some people choose to come here. She brought the kids here so they could wave to their father and he could glimpse his children for a moment from a distance. To hell with the damn north, she said. To hell with this country. It was a feeling the band knew well. Back in 1996, their co-founder was in the parking lot of a Kmart waiting to get his blood drawn at a mobile health clinic when he had to take off running to escape an immigration raid. When he made it home, shaken, he turned the experience into a song. He eventually shared it with Pablo Alvarado, an immigrant rights organizer, and Los Jornaleros del Norte were soon born. Their mission was urgent from the start, to use music, to tell stories of migrant life in America, and to help fight for the rights of the undocumented. When Omar heard the woman's story that day outside the detention center, he remembered being a child back in Mexico, separated from his own parents, by gates, by walls, by distance. Omar's parents left him behind when they came to the U.S. He headed north a year and a half later, crammed into the floorboards of a car that crossed the border at Tijuana. Uh, they put me all the way in the bottom, and some of the people were stepping on me. So it was the longest, longest ride in, in my life. I couldn't breathe, but we finally make it. As he headed home from the detention center, he remembered his panic and the grief of separation and how music can address it. As I jumped into my car, I was thinking about what we do in our home countries. We bring serenata when you're in love or when you want to ask for forgiveness from your loved one. You bring music 
especially at night time and ask for forgiveness or express your love. What we did is a serenata, but it wasn't a serenata to just anybody, it was a serenata to an indocumentado, an undocumented person. They judge us as criminals, he wrote. Don't they know that our hands are the hands that feed them? Omar gave the song to his bandmate Loida Alvarado to sing so that her voice could become the grieving mother's. Wherever you go, I will follow. What is the point without you? They went into the studio, recorded a single, and it got played on LA radio. Day laborers heard La Serenata at job centers across the city. The mother's story, not far from any of their own. Just one more story in a city full of the separated and the detained and the gone. A city full of love that is still in the air. The next time Los Jornaleros played in front of the detention center, they performed La Serenata. As the glow of security lights took over for a setting sun, their performance followed all the rules of a classic serenata. They were down below, singing up to a window. There was a wall, there was a gate, there was distance. Although you're imprisoned, Loida sang, someone who loves you is singing. One by one, the detention center's cell windows began to light up, blinking on and off in time with the music. The windows twinkled like dreams illuminated, like stars aglow, like moonlight.
my gosh. Thank you, Pop-Up Magazine. That was incredible. That was very uh, emotional. I'm sure for a lot of our viewers here. Um, the story, the poetry, the song, the visual, the images, the, 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 the really heart that was expressed by La Marisol, by Los Jornaleros, and by the writing of Josh Kuhn. We're big fans of Josh Kuhn here, and he really brought it, brought it home. Um, illustrations, who did the illustrations for this? They were just so right, right on the money. Ro Rosalie, why don't you come up? I'd like to introduce also Rosalie Ilano. She is uh, at Pop-Up Magazine. She's the Director of Community Engagement and Partnerships, uh, previously with the National Community Engagement Manager at the Independent Television Service. Uh, more than a decade of experience as a community organizer and educator. And she was who, who communicated with, uh, with La Plaza de Cultura y Artes en Casa con La Plaza to bring these, these three wonderful short documentaries to us. So how did this one come about, Rosalie? If you could maybe explain a little bit. Yeah, thank you so much for having us, Abelardo. This is my daughter, Nayeli, joining us. Um, so Pop-Up Magazine is a, we, we were prior to Shelter in Place and the pandemic, we were touring the country um, in Los Angeles. Our, our home theater is the theater at the Ace Hotel in downtown LA. And um, what we do is we bring journalists, filmmakers like Alejandra, um, and journalists like Jose, and radio producers and podcasters on stage to tell new stories. Everything we do is nonfiction. And if you imagine them on stage, uh, they are accompanied by a live orchestra. So everything is, um, there's a musical element. And then this third element, which is the beautiful, stunning visuals. So we tried to recreate that um, in this moment of shelter in place and create these videos for people to enjoy for free online. We're learning a lot as we've pivoted to this digital format. And so that, uh, the Serenade, which you saw with La Marisol, she, we actually, that's a story that we recommissioned that Josh Kuhn actually wrote. So Josh Kuhn is a, a journalist and uh, a professor at USC in journalism. And so he actually told that story on stage at the Theater at the East Hotel um, a few years ago. And we're like, you know what? Um, we have this great opportunity to create stories for Hispanic Heritage Month. And, and release them as a pack. And we were really fortunate to partner with Google to do that. And um, thinking about how we would translate it, um, because there's such, you know, with Los Juanaleros, there's such a strong like music element. It's not just Omar's story, but the, we really wanted the music to sing and have another dimension. And so um, pe people were thinking of who could actually narrate uh, Josh's Hi. script. And um, La Marisol's Mommy, name came Mommy. up, and people are a big fan Mommy. of her work. <laughs> Hold on. Um, people are a big fan of her work, and it, it's just really amazing to see how the staged version um, was um, reimagined for this digital version. Well, it was done incredibly well. Uh, uh, La Marisol, of course, with La Santa Cecilia. Uh, a big friend of La Plaza uh, uh, from Olvera Street as a young uh, child singing to the community and now taking her talents across uh, the, the world, really. And uh, especially with this real touching story, the, the, the jail that she's speaking of is maybe just a few blocks away from Olvera Street, a few blocks away from La Plaza. So there's a real deep connection here. Uh, of course, with the, the day labors, it, it just was a total uh, emotional package that was visually uh, uh, stunning and, and very impactful. So I appreciate that. Uh, and and to your question, Abelardo, the, the illustrator for this piece, uh, she's an artist. Her name is Ariana Viro. Um, and uh, I put the link in the chat so you could see all of the bios for our wonderful contributors, all of the artists, 
and photographers there as well. Uh, yeah. There's also, if you, you know, if folks want to watch all the short stories or the, the films and the videos, and then also go deeper with the discussion, we have a discussion guide you can download for free. So all of that's for free online. Well, thank you. And I just posted the, the uh, Latino Heritage Month uh, for Pop-Up Magazine, which was supported by Google. Could you tell us maybe a little bit about how that relationship took place? Yeah, Google has been um, a great supporter of our live touring show. Um, and they came to us because they were really interested in our, our type of storytelling of like using what's happening in the headlines and what's happening in the world around us. Um, but our storytelling that goes deeper, right? That pulls at your heartstrings and a range of emotions. If you actually watch the pack of stories on the website, there's heartbreaking ones, ones that are deeply emotional. There's ones that are funny. There's ones that are inspiring. So it's the full range of emotion. And we really, um, you know, we're really grateful to them for their support. And so we were able to create these stories. And Alejandra's story was actually one that was part of our spring issue. Um, we just released a fall issue. And, um, you know, it, it seems like we're going to be doing these, these digital versions of our show well into 2021. Um, even if we do go back to touring, we're still going to be releasing digital content. So it's been really exciting because, you know, when we were a live touring show, we could only reach large cities. So like the top 10 to 12 cities where there's large theaters that could support the show. And now we're reaching people from all over the world, which is really exciting. And there's no barrier because the show's completely free. Exactly. And a similar story to La Plaza. Our, our museum is closed. Our, our cultural center is closed. Our programming is, is on temporary hiatus for now. But through this visual, through this virtual uh, platform, we're able to reach a lot more people and to bring, uh, you know, what we have to, to their homes. And, and similar to what Pop-Up Magazine is doing, we really appreciate the three of you coming down here, Pop-Up Magazine, for presenting and offering us this opportunity to showcase these just three of, I don't know, I think there's about 10 at least, uh, in the Hispanic for Hispanic Heritage Month that are featured on your on your page, I, I put the link so that everybody could go ahead and uh, and and see for them yourselves and share them with other people because they are, really are heartfelt, very well done, and uh, and worth viewing uh, you know, at least once, if not more than that. So, any last words, Jose? I just want to say thank you so much for having us and for, for hosting this. You know, it's no small feat. Um, uh, and, you know, we look forward to, I look forward to visiting the space uh, in person. I grew up in Pomona, so a lot of roots with, you know, obviously downtown and Olvera Street and everything in that area. So um, I look forward to hopefully meeting you in person soon. And um, yeah, um, definitely take a look at the issue online and uh, Thank you guys so much for your support. Thank you, Alejandra, any, anything you'd like to say, please? Yeah, just echoing Jose, I'm so happy to be here. It was really fun. This is like the end of our little tour. <laughs> so, you know, it's been, it's been amazing. Um, and I hadn't seen that last film before and oh my God, incredible. So, so incredible. Um, so yeah, I definitely encourage everybody to watch anything that pop up puts out in the near future, like pop-ups amazing. Um, and yeah, thank you La Plaza. This was really, really fun. And I, I wanna go in person too, I've never been. I have a lot of family in San Diego, so kind of close. <laughs> okay, good, well, when we open up, we'll be sure to let you know. Uh, just a couple comments here, Dara, Dara Porter, uh, she says, hi everyone, Dara Porter from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you for sharing such compelling, emotional and wonderful stories. Also, thank you for the link to the other pop-up magazine stories as well. So you're welcome. And, uh, and let's see, we also have from Lucia Moncada. I'm learning a lot through your channel. Thank you for putting this together. Maria Elena Yepes, a good friend at La Plaza. Our young people are amazing. Congratulations to them. Passionate and bold, bravo. So thank you so much, Jose, Angela, and Rosalie. Thank you for appearing on En Casa con La Plaza. All of you out there, if you were not able to catch the entire program, we will have it archived on Facebook, of course. 
and on our website at lapca.org and also our YouTube channel at La Plaza LA. Um, coming up, on La, we, this, isn't, this is maybe the last one for Latino Heritage Month, but Latino Heritage Year continues uh, here at Encasa con La Plaza. Next Monday, we have a full week of programming uh, starting on Monday afternoon at 12 a.m. 12 p.m., excuse me, with the, the impact of COVID-19 on Latinos, the way forward with Dr. David Hayes Bautista, Dr. Yohali B. Anaya, and Dr. Laura E. Martinez from the Center for the Study of Latino Health and Culture at UCLA. Uh, a special that same day, later on at 3 p.m., a special Dia de los Muertos in Casa con la Plaza Cocina session with Maite Gomez Rejon, who will be sipping on mezcal while learning about the history of mole and its ingredients as we prepare en moladas. Uh, on Wednesday, it's election time, Decision 2020 Election Roundtable, moderated by Mirtala Salinas from Estrella TV with Luis Alvarado, Hernan Molina, and Hector Sanchez Barba, uh, who's the director and ex executive director and C CEO of Mi Familia Vota. And then finally on Friday, October 30th, Dan Guerrero, who appears with us every, every other Friday with this happy hour, bringing special guests, an extremely special guest, Dolores Huerta. So that's on Friday, October 30th, on En Casa Con La Plaza. So with that, I'd like to bid everybody an adios. Uh, uh, have a great weekend. Thank you so much once again to all three of you for making this beautiful evening possible. And nos vemos muy pronto. Bye-bye. Thank you.